One of the other young men was sitting on the stairs with me, literally telling me all the reasons why he hated God, why he blasphemed the name of Jesus, why the cross meant nothing to him. And as I began to pray sitting next to this young man, something shifted in his spirit and he completely changed and began weeping. And this young man went up with me into an upper room along with eight of his peers. And one by one, all eight of them publicly confessed their sins, repented, and chose to follow Jesus. Welcome, everybody. This is Simon Gilbo with Inspired. Inspired is all about uh, hearing from people from different walks of life that have had interesting faith journeys uh, through highs and lows. Uh, the variety and the breadth of uh, people that we've had on has been fantastic. I love the, the, the variety in the kingdom of God. And uh, we're bombarded relentlessly with bad news. So this is all about infusing us with, with, with good news, with uh, stories of God at work and, and breaking in into society. And I know you're going to be inspired this week because we've got a fantastic guest. Her name is Sarah Yardley. Welcome, Sarah. Hello. Good morning. And so nice to be with you today. It, oh, it's so good to be with you. Uh, already, as Sarah started speaking, some of you might recognize her, her dulcet tones from um, her. She's a regular contributor at Lectio 365, which is a morning and evening uh, sort of... Uh, I suppose eight to ten minute uh, reflection that uh, I've been doing for the last couple of years and uh, I have to say each night I fall asleep to it pretty much um, but the morning one I don't fall asleep to but you've got such a lo- <laughs> lovely natural voice Sarah do you, do you, have you been voice coached on it or was it just natural? Do you know what? I, I, whenever someone recognizes me for my voice, which happens more often than for my face lately, which is it's kind of a fun thing, um, I'll just use that little line, let's recenter our scattered senses on the presence and work of God. And I have thought about getting vocal coaching. Um, I run a music festival, and so a few of the musicians have given me some great tonal exercises. I'll spare your listeners from hearing them now. Um, but I, I think that our voices are such an important tool, so I actually do everything I can to cultivate my voice to the point that one of my friends who's a preacher herself said to me, I have never seen anyone who takes care of their voice as much as you do. So um, I think we've got to take a care with our voice. And um, I'm, I'm very attentive to the fact that the way a sound hits an ear can make a significant difference. Yeah. Well, um, you mentioned uh, the festival. That's, that's Creation Fest, which you could have, you coordinate, and that's a massive part of your life. And my goodness, it's what responsibility putting you on a free festival with uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds that need to sort of appear materialized from people's generosity, a real faith journey. We'll come to that. Uh, you're also the author of uh, More Change. You've done loads of traveling. Um, you speak a lot. And uh, yes, yeah, so our connection is through Creations Fest. But uh, listen, let's, get, let's go back to your childhood. Um, you were homeschooled. I think you're the first of seven children, Orange County, beautiful place in, in California. Uh, fill us in a bit. Ah, uh, yeah. So I, I grew up in Orange County, California, and it's it's funny. For the last eight years, I've lived in the UK, and one of the things you never stop missing is the sunshine. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love where I get to live now, but there's something about kind of my childhood feeling in many ways soaked in that sense of sunshine. And alongside the literal sunshine, I grew up in the middle of um, the Jesus People Revival at Calvary Chapel. So I just thought it was perfectly normal that you and your ten thousand friends all went to church together. And in my head, it was just one of those all life events. And, you know, we, we saw baptisms of thousands and it was by no means perfect. If anyone's ever been part of a, a revival era, you'll know that God uses faulty and flawed people. Yeah. And so for every beautiful story, there's definitely one that takes a sharper turn. But um, I grew up in this place where my parents were both first generation Christians And they had a real enthusiasm for Jesus that I think I've managed to not lose over the years. Mm -hmm. And where just going to church and being part of the family of God was the most exciting, delightful, interesting thing that we could possibly do. And I think alongside that, one of the remarkable things that Calvary Chapel has done is send out church plants across the world. Mm -hmm. So there's somewhere in the range of 1,700 churches sent out of this one little church in Orange County. So in my mind, it was normative to meet Jesus, spend your life coming to know him in a radical way, spend multiple days out of the week just studying scripture, and then go out to start a new faith community yourself. That was just like the normal Christian life. Yeah. And I think there's something within that as well, that as I approach 40 now, it just feels normal to say, 
you know, we, we follow Jesus, we invite people to come to know him, and then new communities or existing communities of faith are grown because of those who meet Jesus in radical ways. So uh, growing up in Orange County it definitely gave me a faith confidence that I'm, I'm grateful for in a deep way. Yeah, we, we were saying before, before going live, um, I mean, I just got back from the States preaching there, and I went to the cinema and watched The Jesus Revolution, which is a really... Um, high production value film recounting what was going on and I didn't realise so Chuck Smith was actually your pastor uh, Lonnie Frisbee um, go on just, just give a few minutes on, on quite how dramatic it was because it, I, I, for me watching it I mean it was nuts what was taking place yeah, absolutely. So the events of that film, which I haven't yet seen, happened at negative 10 years old for me. So there, there's a few things in that that I can only relay the stories of. But by the time I was born and began to grow up, I, I was born in 1983, um, the church had moved out of that big tent and into an established building. Mm-hmm. And we were just seeped in this expectation of God meeting our faith in miraculous ways. So one little story that I, I will always remember. Um, a bunch of hippies had become to meet Jesus. It, it had overflowed and exploded. And the original church plant had this vision, let's buy a piece of land. Now, the piece of land, it's enormous. It's acres of property in the heart of Orange County. Mm -hmm. And they took a step of faith to purchase this property. And literally the day after they signed the paperwork and put down the down payment in faith for money that they didn't yet have, Shell Oil Company came to them and offered them the price of the whole plot of land to just take a corner that is roughly 30 meters by 30 meters. And so that, that little corner, still to this day, if you go visit Calvary Chapel Coast Mesa, the tiniest corner of the property is occupied by Shell Petrol Station. And um, I, I'm sure that they're a little bit wondering now if they made a good investment, but although on the long <laughs> haul, it probably was, that purchase covered the full cost of the property. Wow. And there was something about living in that kind of culture that gave me this boldness to say, one, let's step out in faith. Let's let's take the big step of believing that God will meet us in provision. But two, Exactly as in that story, and I've seen this in my own life countless times, there's often the way that God meets us after we've taken the step of faith. Mm -hmm. And it would be so much easier if we had the full confidence, the full provision, the full team, the full resource before we took our step of faith. Like That would be really helpful and much more strategic, but that there's so many times that God meets us in our walking out in his name. Yeah. And um, I think growing up in that kind of culture, it, it certainly raises your expectancy that God meets us. Yeah. And yet alongside that, one of the real dynamics of the Calvary Chapel movement is a very simple, authentic, we just open God's word yeah. and we expect that he has something alive to say to us every day. And that's a habit that I began in my young years. And to this day, every morning I go to a, a coffee shop most mornings, I will confess, but I just sit and open God's word and say, Jesus, what do you have to say to me today? Amen. Great. So, um, so when did you sort of come to faith or were you just so sort of marinated in, in the spirit? <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that idea of being marinated in the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, I often say there's not a time when I remember encountering God for the first time, because when you grow up in that kind of environment, faith is so the norm yeah. that there's this um, culture of faithful expectancy that you walk into and inherit as a spiritual legacy. Mm-hmm. And so I would 100% say that the the faith that I inherited and have received for myself came in many ways out of that culture of just being in a place of expectation. But I was nine years old when I had my first real crisis of faith. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought maybe I've just following Jesus because I've been born into a Christian home. And I, I will distinctly remember always that my dad was on this um, activity called the prayer watch. So the people at our church would do all night prayer sessions, but you could also call in on a, on a phone line with a cord and mm-hmm. receive prayer. And my nine-year-old self had this faith crisis. And my mom, who was probably half convinced I was just trying to get out of bedtime, Mm -hmm. uh, let me call in to this prayer watch. And I remember my dad answered the phone and I said, Dad, I think I'm only a Christian because I've been raised in a Christian home. And I'm so grateful that that night he took the time to really think with me about Christianity 
as one of the oldest of the world religions, Mm -hmm. just the historic place that it holds as the continuation of Judaism and how it sits with Buddhism and Hinduism as the three kind of oldest faith traditions. And then he spoke to me particularly about how in the Christian faith, Jesus is the God who comes to us Mm -hmm. and essentially just unpacked for me this beautiful idea of grace. And I remember at nine years old thinking, if there is a God, I would pray that it would be a God of love. And if it's a God of love, I would pray that he would reveal himself. And if he has revealed himself, there doesn't seem to me a more beautiful story than the story of Jesus Christ, the revealing God who has come to us. Mm-hmm. And so with as much of my mind as I could hold at age nine years old, I thought this was the idea I wanted to follow. Um, I was 16 when I realized that following Jesus would cost something mm-hmm. um, as it so often said mission is participation and suffering and glory. And I was 16 years old when I just realized, oh, this is this is going to be costly. And I chose that it would be worth it to follow Jesus in the costly places. But then I would say I was 25 years old when I had my first radical encounter with the Holy Spirit. And so when I think back over my testimony, sometimes I, I think, which of these is the story of where I met Jesus? And to me, it feels like the answer is yes. Yeah. Yes, I was raised in a home where God was loved and, and honored. Yes, I intellectually said, no, this is the way I want to follow God. Yes, I, I followed him in the costly places. And then yes, Today, I know that I'm only able to follow him through the anointing, empowering work of the Holy Spirit in my life. Mm. Okay, let's go back to your, your age 16. You talk about the cost, because often in the Western church, you know, we sort of, we downplay the cost in, in it. Well, we shouldn't, but often it is downplayed in the call to follow. And uh, so was the cost because your mum's health issues or, or what was going on that made you understand that there'd be a cost? Yeah, so the the particularities of that story will give a little glimpse into my life as well. Um, My grandfather lived with us and we cared for him for just over eight years. And during the period of time when that happened, um, we had been caring for him at his house, but for a period of time, he moved into the house with us. So just to set the scene, I'm the oldest of seven children. My mom is pregnant with my fifth sibling. Um quite an elderly cantankerous grandfather is living with us <laughs> and I'm doing quite a lot of his physical care and his um, medical care as well. He had fallen and had a bed sore that needed tending. And then in addition to all of that, I had ended up doing most of kind of the laundry and the house care for the house. And so one day I was sitting with my mom and I was just at my boiling point and I exploded and said, you know what, this isn't fair. I'm a smart kid. I should be doing schoolwork. I should not be helping our family in this way. And um, just, just was really full of quite a lot of anger. And I remember my mom looked at me and she just said, Sarah, for this moment of time, this is the life that God has given us. Mm-hmm. And we can either choose to react in bitterness or we can receive God's power with us for it. And do you know what? Sometimes I, I would love to be mature enough to say that I was a 16 year old who said, yes, mom, what <laughs> you've spoken to me is the word of God. I receive it. I was so angry still um, because I recognized that there was something in that moment of me either choosing to enter into the sacrificial grace of God and follow Jesus, even in the painful places, or I could just keep being angry and a little bit bitter. And honestly, some of that anger and bitterness might have been legitimized Mm -hmm. or excused or defended by my wider community. And I just remember thinking, do you know what? I can't say it out loud to her right now, but she is right. I can either let God meet me in this, or I can just keep holding on to this. And so that would have been the time in my life where I just distinctly remember there's going to be a cost. There's going to be a costliness to the life of faith. Mm -hmm. And I believe, even though I might not be ready to say this fully, I want to believe that following Jesus is worth even the costly moments. Mm. Amen. So um, you went into publishing pretty early. Tell us about that part of your journey. 
Yes, I was 16 years old when I began to work at a Christian book publishing distributor. And this is a bit of a niche category. It's kind of one of those pathways that no one else really could walk through because it doesn't exist any longer. Um, But at that era, there was this booming business of sales to church bookstores. Mm -hmm. And so I began to be uh, what you would call a I suppose, a middle person between. We would work with publishers, source and curate a line of products for church bookstores. And um, we worked with 200 publishers, source those products and sold them to 700 church bookstores. Um, At its peak, we were, you know, processing somewhere in the range of 7 million in sales. So mid-range for American publishing, but decent sized for being a a young person working their first job. And, um, you know, I think one of the fascinating things about working in and being involved in Christian ministry is I often say, tell me your very best story and I'll tell you one that matches it. Tell me your very worst story and I can tell you one that matches that as well. Uh Because working in ministry, particularly from quite a young age, just gave me an exposure to both some of the best and some of the worst. Sure, yeah. And a little story that just stands out from that time I went to this Christian publishing convention and Anne Graham Lotz was preaching. And at that point in time, I had no context for strong, charismatic female preachers. Mm-hmm. And I was also with a, a large group. I mean, probably a thousand of us who are in the Christian publishing industry. And Anne got up and she read from Isaiah chapter six. And she said, will you open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter six? And she looked around the room and no one moved a muscle because all of us in Christian publishing had not brought our Bibles to the convention. Yeah, yeah. And she just paused for a moment and then she said firmly, and, and I suppose a little bit strongly, men and women, do not forget the reason why you are here. And it was an unforgettable moment for me because here we were making our money off of a Christian publishing industry and not a single one in the room had brought their Bible with them to a teaching session. Yes. Convicted. Well, um, so I don't want to jump ahead unless you've got other, I mean, other key moments to share, but I, I'm excited when you talk about your, your third clear faith moment, age 26, about having a profound encounter. What, what did that look like? Yeah, so Simon, I I, uh, had worked at this beautiful church where revival had been birthed and church plants had been sent out. But as some will relate to, the larger something grows, the harder it is to maintain that rugged, simplistic, authentic, desperate need for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so the era in which I grew up at Calvary Chapel and began to work there, it had become a little bit more regulated. Uh, The simplest way I can say it is the same church that had said, we're going to rip out the carpet so that the hippies will have a place to come. That same church had become so formalized that you couldn't bring a water bottle into the sanctuary, lest you should spill some water and stain the expensive carpet, Um, which just gives you an idea of how quickly something can move in a very short and compressed period of time. And so I... um, felt really strongly at age 26 that I needed to branch into some new categories. And so I left my job in Christian publishing and distribution and handed that over to another team. And I went to work at this church called Reality Carpinteria in um, above Santa Barbara area in California. Mm-hmm. And the leader at that time was a man named Britt Merrick. He's actually left pastoral ministry and is the best surfboard shaper in the world now. It, it's a neat <laughs> Niche category, but, you know, someone's got to do it. (laughs) And uh, you know what? There was something about the authentic, dynamic, real desperate hunger for God in that community that transformed my life. Mm. And as is so often the case, the more you try to dissect it, the more you realize that there's no dissecting the work of the Spirit of God other than simply to say that there was a hunger for Jesus, a real authentic recognition that ministry flows from intimacy and an expectancy of the raw work of the Spirit of God that left us face down on the carpets in worship. And in that time, there was just a moment where I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a way that was significant for me. And from that time forward, I would say one of the passions of my life has been to see people walk in the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. 
because there's no set of work or rules or guidelines that replaces that. And uh, it was during my time at Reality that I would say I was anointed with the power of the Spirit for myself. But even just this last week, Britt and I were on the phone. He was about to board a flight to Australia. And I asked him, Britt, what made you invite me to come? And he said, you know what, Sarah, I just listened to the Holy Spirit at every moment. And I said to him, and this is to my shame, I said, Britt, I think as a leader today, 15 years later, I probably am listening to the Holy Spirit 60% of the time. All right. And he took a deep breath. He said, Sarah, that's not good. <laughs> there, 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 there should be this moment where we are so in tune with the heartbeat of the Spirit of God that we're not listening to the Holy Spirit 60% of the time and then doing the work in our own effort and wisdom the rest. Yeah. And so I felt really challenged literally this week to say, I listen to, I know how to hear, I'm attentive to the voice of the Spirit, but sometimes I make a really good plan and just run with it. And I want to be in that place where I'm always listening to and desperately hungry for the Spirit of God. Yeah. And I mean, you're talking as someone involved in, you know, we don't even call it this, do we, full-time ministry, but but that applies to all of us, isn't it? Listening right now, it's like, you know, we want to be guided by the Spirit, walking and keeping a step with the Spirit, not running ahead, not lag, lagging behind, and, and not just 60% of the time or 20% of the time or whatever it is. We want to be fully surrendered vessels, really in tune with what the Lord's saying. Hey, um, you know, people listening, there'll be a pretty broad tent of, of different theologies and ranges of even use of terminology. So, you know, when you talk about, and you'll understand that, when you talk about baptism in the spirit, can you just dig into that a bit more? What did that look like for you? Yeah, absolutely. Do you know, uh, one of the beautiful complexities of the Church of God is how diverse we are. Yeah. And I love that diversity. So for me, this would just be as simple as to say, I felt the real intimate presence of God with me in a way that was fully my own, close to my heart. And that sense of the presence of God with me has never left me since. And um, there are moments where there have been what, you know, in Christian vocabulary, we often call the wilderness places. Mm -hmm. So very, very shortly after this, Britt Merrick's daughter, Daisy, who was the light and heart of many of our lives, um, died of cancer after four rounds of childhood cancer. Mm. And I still remember, you know, I, I had this experience with being anointed with the Spirit. I, I really felt that sense of the nearness of God. But very shortly after, I remember sitting in my car just screaming at God, why did you let her die? Yeah. And to be baptized with or anointed with or to know the presence of the Holy Spirit doesn't safeguard us from every pain or worry or trauma. It's actually the opposite of that. It means that in those places of relentless wound, of deep pain, of unanswered questions, that we expect and believe that the presence of the suffering Savior is still with us. Mm. And so for me, the, the presence of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, it wasn't accompanied by any extraordinary sign. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I didn't immediately start singing out in tongues, although I do believe in and practice the gift of tongues. I didn't start walking around dancing on clouds. There was, there was no um, probably change more or less than deep within my own soul. I had this sense, oh, oh Jesus is with me. His Spirit is near to me. And I was awakened to finding the presence of God with me in all things. Mm. Oh, beautifully expressed. Hey, folks, I love it, the impact of this podcast. And thank you, those of you that are spreading the news. Could I challenge all of you listening to this? Could you share this podcast with three of your mates to see if they would subscribe? It's just getting great news out there. And listen, if you want to receive a weekly WhatsApp ping, just one ping, to make it easy for you to share with other people, because often I listen to podcasts and think, oh, that's brilliant, but I find it hard to know how to share it. You can sign up at greatlakesoutreach.org forward slash WhatsApp. That's greatlakesoutreach.org forward slash WhatsApp. And then you get one ping a week that you can forward to your mates. Then also, how about a, a weekly email on it? That would be greatlakesoutreach.org forward slash inspired email. You could do that, greatlakesoutreach.org forward slash inspired email. 
And uh, there are giving options there if you want to support the podcast. It's under the auspices of Great Lakes Outreach, and we're serving the poorest and hungriest country in the world in Burundi. So I'd love your support in that. Anyway, God bless you for your encouragement, support, and emails. Loving it. Now let's get back to the podcast. You've done a lot of work with teenagers. Can you dig into that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, do you know, one of the things I love, and, and it's important that I always say this, I was the most reluctant youth worker of all time. <laughs> I literally had, there were no strands in my heart to the, the youth community. I went on my first ever um, trip with young people, literally because I was standing in the parking lot and there was a car about to head to Mexico for the weekend. My sister was leading a small trip down to Mexico to work with some orphanages there. And they said to me, Sarah, if you can go home and be back in 15 minutes, you get a free weekend trip to Mexico. And it was 100% the trip to Mexico, not the teenagers that got me in on that first trip. Um, But you know, at that moment, uh, I think I was 25 years old, 26 years old. um, I, I jumped in this car and I remember being in a room and seeing the lives of young people shifted and unlocked in a radical way by a combination of service, of of seeing something outside of their own context and of reflection. And I thought this is the kind of thing I would like to know more of being part of. At that point, I never would have dreamed that I would lead anything. Mm. I just thought maybe I could occasionally jump in the car again on a trip like this. And um, for the the next six years, God just began to open doors. And and honestly, Simon, I just walked through whichever doors he gave me. Um, There's a a long story there that's maybe for another podcast, but over six years time, I led um, over 500 young people on their first ever, what we would call like a missions trip or mission experience. Mm -hmm. And I was able to mentor well over a hundred of those young people. Um, But one of the most significant of those moments is that I took a group of 74 seniors to the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. And um, I was naive at the time. I still walk in joyful naivete. (laughs) And um, I didn't realize how many of them were incentivized more by the trip to Dominican Republic than by the opportunity to serve Jesus. Now, bear in mind the story I've just told. This was my own origin story, but I just somehow thought that God had really moved on the life of these high school seniors and they just wanted to love God in Dominican. So we get on this trip, we arrive, and I'm sitting on a bus next to one of the young men who I didn't realize at the time was actually quite a notable drug dealer within the community as well. (laughs) And he turns to me, we're about to go out and do an outreach, and he says, I don't believe in God. And I was like, what in the world are you here for then? We are here on a mission trip to tell people about Jesus. And um, we got out and we did the outreach and I just began to pray. Holy Spirit, I need you to touch the hearts of these young people because they're all from wealthy Orange County Christian homes. They've gone to Christian schools. They know everything in their head Mm. and they know nothing in their hearts. And um, that trip, There was a radical move of the Holy Spirit that I can only explain as my closest foretaste of revival. One of the other young men was sitting on the stairs with me, literally telling me all the reasons why he hated God, why he blasphemed the name of Jesus, why the cross meant nothing to him. And as I began to pray sitting next to this young man, something shifted in his spirit and he completely changed and began weeping. Wow. And he just said, I'm angry against God, but I actually know that the cross is the place of salvation. And this young man went up with me into an upper room along with eight of his peers. And one by one, all eight of them publicly confessed their sins, repented, and chose to follow Jesus. And that rippled out into my team of 74. And bear in mind, we'd come to this country to invite others to know Christ. Mm. But they met with God in such a radical way that to this day, as far as I know, all of them still have a relationship with Jesus. And many of them are walking in faith, leadership, and ministry due to a real move of the Holy Spirit that happened in a radical, unexpected way. And so I've got this like beautiful love for teenagers and God's given me, um, I would say, and again, to use another Christian term, an anointing Mm -hmm. for 
favor with these communities because honestly, on paper, it does not make sense. I'm a 39-year-old super Christian kid woman (laughs) who is pretty darn straight-laced and has still never even kissed a boy and uh, walk into the room with most of my teenage or young adult communities, and there's just this deep love that God has given them for me. And I I say it has to be a work of the Holy Spirit because on paper, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, my own journey, mission trips are absolutely key and... uh, you know, well, I, I, I've told this story before, but I just think it's so powerful. You know, you, I would travel as, to Brazil from from England for, for this this five seconds of my life, which was well, we were we were mugged by um, street kids. We'd gone out to help them, and it was very scary. Um, and we needed police protection. And and off, in the evening, we were debriefing, processing that experience, and I. I, I wept at the brokenness of those precious little kids who who weren't cute at all. You know, they'd been abused since day one, and they were violent and aggressive, and and mm. and, and they were scary. These little lives were scary. And, you know, on mass, they were they were dangerous. And as I wept, my team leader came over, put his arm around me, and said that this this line that has completely changed my life, which is pity cries. And then goes away, but compassion stays. Wow. Pity cries and then goes away or turns the channel. And I was crying, but I could easily disengage, but compassion stays. And uh, mm. that's been a sort of life mantra. I choose to stay. Incarnation means staying. Jesus chose to stay. He chose to get his hands dirty. And that can be geographical. So for me, 25 years with Burundi, uh, 20 years in country, now still going three times a year. But but, um, you know, mission strip out of context in a different culture. It's, it's almost, it's fertile soil, isn't it? To hear God's voice in a different way. We're disarmed. We're away from our own securities. And, uh, yeah, powerful. So, again, people, I, I just think, you know, for, for our kids or for ourselves, might the Lord be saying you need to just um, go and be exposed to something different uh, and, and see God at work in a different culture and context. I, You've done loads of those. I've done loads of those. Um, one thing we've got in common is, that uh, uh, we both travel around the world. When we left Burundi in 2018 as a family, we travel around. The- what's what's interesting, as you sent, sent through some info on you, is that we literally, in our world tours, went to the exact same number of countries. So we all, no, uh, yeah, 30, 30, 34 countries, isn't it funny? Um, we, we don't want to sort of just be a, a sort of travel or glory story, <laughs> but, but um, you know, give us, because... I wanted my kids to sort of see God at work in different cultures and it's so healthy, isn't it? So what are your sort of highlights of that time? Yeah, absolutely. Simon, I feel like we probably could turn this into a travel (laughs) podcast. So I'll I'll try to guard us from that. Um, I think probably the most extraordinary and significant spiritual moments in my travels have been when I've had the opportunity to visit emerging faith communities. Mm -hmm. Um, So one that just stands out starkly is I went to Myanmar in 2012. And it's one of the few times that I felt a sense of hearing some some form of the audible voice of God. Mm -hmm. I was sitting in church and I was at Calvary Chapel at this point in time. And I heard a voice in my ear literally saying the word Myanmar. Mm-hmm. Now, it's an unusual word. It's, it's not actually said very often. And it's the kind of place that many people on this listening might just say, I need to actually Google and figure out where that country even is. Um, you'll, you'll primarily know it from the king and I, and it was known as Burma. Mm-hmm. And I turn around and the couple behind me in church are a Burmese couple who have just come back from Myanmar. Mm-hmm. And I had an unexpected 10 days off of work. And I just thought, you know what? I think I'm going to go visit Myanmar. And my airline miles added up so that my flight was $12 to get there. (laughs) And I arrived with no strategy plan and just a handful of connections from this couple who'd been sitting behind me in church. And at this point in time, the country had just opened to the wider world several years before. It had been primarily closed to the Western world prior to that. And I ended up with some of the most extraordinary spiritual experiences of my life. The one that just is easy to tell and stands out quite strongly is I was invited to come speak at a small Bible college. And that Bible college was comprised of 30 individuals who had come from 14 different provinces around the country. Mm -hmm. All of them had come to receive two years of Bible training so that they could plant churches around the country. And the passage that they were teaching on was the passage that I had just finished preparing in detail Mm. for a teaching series in my church in Orange County. 
So I ended up giving four hours of teaching on the book of Acts, um, which was obviously timely on every level imaginable. And this whole group, all 30 of these, knew that they were training and then going back into many of them quite hostile zones. This was before kind of the Free Burma Rangers um, had come to light. And so they were going back into quite hostile zones and ready at the expense of death to go plant these churches and proclaim the gospel. And I just found it so tremendously moving that God had used such a ordinary and at the same time simple series of events to bring me to this country, to enable me to be gifted to teach these church planters. And to this day, I've not kept in touch with any of them, but I believe with all my heart that there are 30 churches scattered throughout the country who I had the chance to uh, speak a word of encouragement over those planters before they went out. And I think there's something just tremendous about being part of communities where faith and expectancy are so um, raw and honest. Yeah. That's, I think, what we're all longing for at all times. Like, we want the kind of faith that believes to move mountains, that comes at the expense of our lives. And yet, because it costs us everything, we know Jesus is worth everything. Mm. And, and in my travel, I have seen so much of that that gives me the desperate hunger and longing to see more of that within Western church communities. Yeah. Oh, and I, I think of those precious. Uh, Burmese um, people, because I mean, we we also went there. They are going through a hell of a time right now, and I've, I've preached to them on Zoom, and they're all scattered, you know, in different nations now, and or in the nation, and they're so broken. And Lord, have mercy on Myanmar mm-hmm. right now. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, those precious people you'll have trained up, and yeah, just uh, serving Christ, uh, the scattered body, scattered through persecution, through suffering. Oh, it, that that I, again, I wanted my kids to see going through Eastern Europe and. Just just seeing the how much suffering was caused through the through communism, and uh, you know meeting people that've been in prison for their faith, it's very challenging for us in the Western world, isn't it? Where you know what does our suffering look like? It might look like a copying a bit of flack on social media or something. And it's always fascinating, isn't it, Simon? Because I think alongside that, having had the chance to see something of the grace of God, but something of the brokenness of the world in 92 countries, what you don't want to do is come back to a Western context and bring a guilt trip or bring a um, flagellating of our souls. Because actually for each of us, the decision to follow Jesus has its own cross to bear. Mm -hmm. And one of the realities that I'm sure you'll attest to as well is having spent quite a bit of time in quite poor communities, there is such a deep joy in God's presence that comes with those who are completely lacking in any material wealth. And I remember distinctly, I, I went to Tanzania a couple years ago and conveniently climbed Kilimanjaro while I was there, which was one of the best <laughs> and worst decisions of my life. Um, but my, my companion for that trip, a Tanzanian man, he turned to me and said, Sarah, they say to me that in your world, People are so sad that they take their own lives. Is it true? We've never heard of such a thing here. Hmm. And I'm sitting in a community where the average individual is making pennies on the pound against our type of income, where they live in quite challenging home situations. His parents had just moved back to a literal mud hut with no running water by choice. It was a village that they'd grown up in. It was where they wanted to return to. But he had no concept for a world in which there would be so much sadness Mm. that one might choose to take their own life. And I think that that reality of, of seeing something of the work of God in other countries has made me realize each one is in its different way a gift to the other. Yeah. And there's places that we have to learn from the global church. And yet also from a place of privilege, there's places in which we can be gift to the global church as well. And so I've really tried in both mind and heart and travel to be attentive to not having even the slightest spirit of colonialism or um Western savior, Hmm. but to come and say, how can I take the position of a learner and how can I speak the words of life, but also receive the words of life from communities of those who've met Jesus in extraordinary ways. Mm. Yeah. Profound. Um, Just bringing things up now to your English chapter, you moved to Mm. England. What, what, what drew you here? Was it creation fest or how did that pan out? 
Yeah, so I first came to the UK in the summer of 2009, and I came over as a wide-eyed tourist. Man, I had watched all the Jane Austen films. <laughs> we were entranced by the story of the royal family. Uh, there were there were many innocent and naive moments in the early ages of my journey. And what kept me coming back from 2009 to 2014 was genuinely just the people. Uh, just last night, I was with two of my first friends, people I met in 2009, and um we developed this friendship. And so I, I came back every year both to invest in the Festival of Creation Fest, but also just to, to see and reunite with friends. Summer of 2014, I arrived with my little suitcase of summer clothing, planning to be here for a couple of weeks, and woke up to the news that the previous director of Creation Fest had passed away quite suddenly the night before. Mm. It was a bit of a sucker punch, Simon, because we had prayed with such faith and expectancy for his healing that genuinely the thought had not crossed my mind that he might not be healed. Mm -hmm. And so when he died, there was this kind of double sorrow. There was the sorrow of the unanswered prayer, but there was also the sorrow of looking at a charismatic, bold, all-in leader and just thinking no one can replace this leader. And uh, to this day, that is true. But I was reading in my Bible and the passage I was reading that next day was in the book of Isaiah chapter 49. And it begins with these words, listen to me, O coastlands, pay attention, you people who've come from afar. From the body of your mother, I have named you by name. I've made my word in your mouth like a sharp sword. I've called you to bring light to the nations and carry the message of salvation to the ends of the earth. And I just wrote in my Bible, God, are, are you calling me to Cornwall? Mm -hmm. With a big question mark. And two weeks later at the festival, literally on the day of the funeral of the previous director, uh, a friend of mine came and asked if he could pray a prophetic word over me. And I said, absolutely. And he actually does not remember this, but it is true. Um, he said, God, we thank you for Sarah. We thank you that her calling is to the coastlands. We thank you that from the body of her mother, you have named her by name. Wow. Thank you. We've made her word in her mouth like a sharp sword and your calling on her life is to bring light to the nations and salvation to the ends of the earth. Mm. And I really felt a sense in that moment through both the prophetic word that God had prepared, prepared me with, the prophetic word given in community, and then over the course of the next few weeks, the confirmation from my friends and family that this passage of scripture, which is a messianic prophecy, it speaks to the, the coming of Jesus, the anointed savior, the only one who brings light to the nations, uh, but that there was something in it that was particular to my story. And so I, um, I stayed in England. I stayed for six months on my tourist visa. And then I did go return to become more legal. Don't worry, those who are listening, I do <laughs> live in England on a legal visa at this point. Um, but that was eight years ago. And I often say at that time, if I'd had an inkling of the pain and the loneliness and the questions and the challenges, I probably would have said no. Mm. I probably would have said, Jesus, you could, you could choose someone else for this. But I also look back at the last eight years of living here, almost nine years now of living here in the UK, and I see all the ways that God has broken my heart only in order to expand it. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine any other journey than the one where he has met me and opened doors for me in this country. I love your, your honesty and your clear thinking and you express yourself so well. So go on, tell us about the, the loneliness and the pain that you've been through. What does that look like? Well, Simon, just to paint a little bit of a picture, I was part of this large scale church community. I mean, when I say we went to church with my 10,000 friends, that's not an exaggeration. Hmm. An average Sunday at Costa Mesa was 10,000 people. I lived in a land of sunshine. I come from a family with six siblings. My family are still some of my best friends. I worked with a staff of 700 people <laughs> out of church. <laughs> And my only experience in the UK was the Festival of Creation Fest. So I thought it was normative for 3,000 friends to gather and sing worship songs with joy yeah. and camp and pray and dance and celebrate and sing. This was my experience. So then I, I say yes to Jesus and I'm living in a small rural Cornish town. It rains every day. <laughs> The 
churches in town are slightly more muted in their tone <laughs> than the festival. Um, they're also slightly more diverse in their teaching style. So I'm hungry for some rich, authentic Bible teaching. And the Anglican church, they seem to only preach for 12 minutes. What's going on? <laughs> um, I live in a population where it's 70% council housing. It's 30% farming community. The name of Jesus is not usually used in a way that is kind, honoring, or prayerful. In fact, when people say Jesus Christ, they seem rather angry. Hmm. And uh, everything about my life at this moment is transformed from a, a loving community that held me to a space of quite genuine isolation and, and a real gray that comes along with it, both in the weather, but a little bit in my mind and body and soul. Mm. And so I think when I say, if I'd understood what be involved, particularly in those first months where to forge new friendships and build new community is never straightforward, but add in some of the particular complexities of an overeager, slightly hyper American who everyone immediately takes as disingenuous because no one is actually that excited to go to church. Yeah. <laughs> um, add in those things together and, and you'll have an inkling of what some of that loneliness would have looked like. Yeah. But Simon, I, I will just say this and there's much I could say. I would have said before moving to England that Jesus was my closest companion and best friend. But it wouldn't have been true. Mm -hmm. It would have been that my family and my real flesh and blood friends, they were my best friends. And in those seasons of loneliness, that posture of Jesus is my best friend moved from a nice idea to an actual reality. Mm. Yeah. I can relate in that when I was 18, I went to teach in South Africa and I had recently, my dad had recently busted me for drugs and uh, which I only say because I nailed that issue which is really important because otherwise mm -hmm. I think I would have got cane every day because I was so lonely I was an extreme extrovert in the middle of nowhere yeah. uh, and um, and it was like well basically the, the sort of head knowledge it was either can I be really blunt and say as either compromise and sleep with a farm woman and get AIDS or or get holy, and uh, yes. and it was like I, I was forced. It was, this is pre social media, pre internet, pretty much, and I'm so glad for that because it pushed me into digging deep. And I can say exactly your you know that the concept of having God as your best friend, whatever, just moved to actually being a reality only through the furnace of crippling suffering in loneliness. And loneliness could be uh, as as much suffering as any physical pain, can't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the um, one of the realities of our Christian journey on every level is that I still often would, would like to spare people from every place of pain, suffering, heartache. Mm -hmm. I would just love to fast forward past those chapters and get us to the glory moments. Mm -hmm. But it's in reality only in those places of need and lack and weariness and worry that our souls become enlarged to receive all that God has for us. Mm -hmm. And so I've learned to pay attention to the wilderness places. And, and I don't say that in a cheap way. It, that's been a discipline of the last 39 years of my life. But in any place that there's a wilderness to ask the spirit, what new way are you teaching me to listen to, to love, to learn from you? Because I think for so much of my early years of faith, I, I thought of wilderness as judgment. Mm -hmm. I thought of it as pain. I thought of it as suffering. I thought of it as almost the vindictive nature of God. And the longer I walk with Jesus, the more I know that in those wilderness places, there is so much of the tender compassion of Christ. And what he's teaching me to do is to learn and know and follow him in a new or different or deeper way than I ever have before. Mm. You know, I feel like this is a unique podcast from all the others I've done because it's like there's a real weightiness in what you're saying. I feel like wanting to pause for 10 seconds at the end of each, you know, answer just because there's, it, it's worth re-listening to. There's, there's real meat in here. I, I hope people enjoy it as much as I am. Listen, we're running out of time, um, yeah. but come on, on Creations Fest, it, it, it must be very stressful when you've got a, a bottom line of money that, you, you know, you, you're paying up front, you've got debts, potentially hundreds of thousands. What, what does that look like? And uh, give us the stories of, of God at work there. 
Yeah, Simon, I've got a really great friend called Tim Chaddick, and he has helped me understand this this reality more than almost any of my other friends. Sarah, what you're doing is impossible. <laughs> and uh, my friend Tim planted a, a beaming church in the center of Los Angeles. So when he speaks about impossible things, uh, they're, they're, we've both lived a few impossible stories. Um, one of the, the great beauties and challenges of stewarding something large scale is that there are obstacles at every corner. Mm. So you've got exactly as you flagged up the obstacle of finance and uh, my goodness, both the stories of need and the stories of provision could take a whole other podcast. And we've walked through so many moments where we've been unsure of what the pennies are in the bank. And the, the one thing I'll just say to that is it is necessary to be committed to prayer in such a deep and authentic way that you recognize that God is your provider. Mm -hmm. Secondly, to be surrounded by the prayerful companions who will say to you, here's the places to walk forth in boldness, like carry on, be strong. God's called us to this. And also to have the prayerful companions who will say, are we doing this because of the call of God or are we doing this because we feel like we should? Mm. So I I think that, that that balance is always true. There's a challenge of people. And without divulging any overly um, intimate stories, over the course of the last 14 years, when I've been involved with Creation Fest, I have seen more romance than I ever imagined. I mean, my Creation Fest couples list list is going 50 people strong, a whole (laughs) lot of love stories. And we've seen more pain. I've, I've hosted funeral services. We had a a Creation Fest camper who went into labor at the festival and the baby didn't make it. Mm. And in the middle of running the festival, I went down to the hospital and held a a baby who is now in heaven and grieved with a family who I love very dearly. We've had moments of miraculous healing where I've seen sight restored, hearing restored, people just transformed inside and out. And we've also seen the long, slow journey of faith. Uh, I recently did interviews with eight individuals who had done, who had met Jesus for the first time at Creation Fest. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I found fascinating is that all eight of them responded in such different ways. We give kind of big, bold, classic gospel invitations. If you want to come meet Jesus, come to know him. Mm -hmm. But none of the eight of them had actually responded publicly during one of those big, bold gospel invitations. Mm -hmm. And none of them got caught by my quote unquote systems for capturing people's faith decisions. They had gone back to their tent and prayed privately. They had turned to their friend who brought them and received Jesus. They'd gone out to the food vendors and had a crep and then made the decision to follow God. I mean, literally the diversity of the stories of how people have met Jesus is extraordinary. Um, And then alongside both the finance and the people, one of the things I'll just say and note for anyone who's involved in Christian work of any way is that I'm increasingly aware of just the weight of spiritual warfare Mm. that attends any significant work of God. And uh, one of the things that we have really committed to as a team is to say we are going to contend for and with each other, and we're going to contest against the forces of darkness. And, you know, we we alluded earlier to kind of the, the boundaries of charismatic theology. But what I will just say within this is, I believe that we are literally in the midst of a spiritual battle every day. Mm-hmm. And the longer I walk with God and the longer I'm part of inviting people to come to know Jesus, the more I'm aware to and attentive to the fact that forces of darkness, quite literally the enemy of our souls, Satan, the devil, is constantly at work to distract, to discourage, and to dismay people, both Christians and not from walking with God. Mm. And one of our most bold and authentic tasks as the follower of Jesus is to proclaim the light of the kingdom of God that is in breaking in our world today. And to say that the power of the resurrected savior is stronger than any other, but the authority that we've been given is such that as Paul writes in Ephesians, we must daily choose to stand firm because our battle isn't just against flesh and blood, it's against principalities and powers and spiritual forces. And so what that means for me is that in a field in Cornwall, what it looks like is I've organized a big festival and I've invited a bunch of musicians and I've got 500 volunteers and we've made a step of faith with finance. That's what it looks like. 
But in reality, we are contesting forces of spiritual darkness, and we're proclaiming the inbreaking power of the kingdom of God in a place where there has been territorial spirits who have overseen lives and dominions and countries and areas. And so I try to use that language as clearly and as carefully as possible, because the attention, I believe, should always be put on Jesus Christ. Mm. If you ask me what's the one drumbeat message of my soul, it's simply know Jesus and know life in his name. But I'm also aware that any great work of God will always come with contesting and that God has armed us in the spirit to walk into the battle and to claim and name the power of Jesus over souls that have been captivated by darkness. Um, And one last little thing I'll say on this, and then I'll stop my little preaching rant. Um, (laughs) I just recently spent a week with a beautiful preacher named Christine Kane, and she's working with human trafficking with A21, phenomenal work that God has given her to do. But she has said um, often, both privately to me and, and now publicly, I will not enter into a battle for which there are no spoils. And while I believe that much of the Christian life is to walk in and towards victory in the spirit, I'm also always asking God, what is the battle that you are calling me to enter? Mm -hmm. And where is the victory that you have already won that you're inviting me to claim? And not to walk blindly into the battlefields that God has not called me to enter. Listen, so there's this Nigerian guy called Uche, and um, I met him th- five weeks ago, maybe, in Cardiff. And uh, he had just got onto Inspired. And he said, in the last week, I've listened to 20 Inspireds. And uh, and then he wrote to me a few weeks ago, he said, I listen to all 100 now. And he's, oh! so he, he is binge listening to them. But the way he's doing it is listening to them at one and a half speed, you know. And I'm like, Uche, right now, you're going to have to slow down and go back to normal speed or half speed. I feel like there's so much meat in what you're sharing that it needs to be re-listened to and weighed up. You're... Um, Honestly, Sarah, you're a wonderful wordsmith. It's poetic, it's lyrical, it's profound. I don't want to stop, but we've got to stop. But I'm going to give you one last sort of um, open question. Anything else that we've missed that, I mean, there's so much you, you could share, but anything else you want to share in closing? Anything you want to promote? Go for it. Uh, so kind. I, I think just for those who are listening, as you've heard my brain dump of story hmm. and um, uh, just a little bit of the gold that God has mined in my soul, My simple word to you is live in the spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to be your closest companion and guide. Believe that in the words of Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, though you have eaten the bread of sorrow and you have drunk the water of affliction, yet your teacher will be near to you. You will hear a voice in your ear saying, this is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right or to the left, The favor of our God is towards us. So believe and expect that the spirit of God is with you. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Sarah, I have loved this. And I am definitely listening to this two or three more times. Thank you so much for your time. Guys, Creation Fest is free. So we could get several extra thousand people going (laughs) down there to Cornwall. (laughs) Come, come, come. Creationfest.org.uk. We would love to see you. What's the website? Say it again. So creationfest.org.uk or at creationfestuk on all socials would absolutely love. And I'm at Sarah Yardley on most social channels. So would be delighted to connect with you. Um, Simon, thanks for hosting such beautiful stories. It inspires all of us Mm, to walk with Jesus. It is such a pleasure. Guys, please give us a a, a top quality review on Spotify or iTunes. If you want to be in touch with me, simongilbo.com. We'll put Sarah's blurbs in there, as she's just said. Um, Wow. Wow. I'm, I'm really, I'm really beautifully moved. I've got, I sort of I feel like I've feasted. It's been great. Um, I want to thank Adam Thomas Steer for the editing, Mike Sandman for the mixing. Next week we'll have a fantastically different voice, uh, but another brilliant guest. Looking forward to that. In the meantime, you guys have a great week. God bless you and toodaloo. <laughs>